welcome to Real Economy. I'm Maitre Sita Raman. In this episode, we are in Brussels, getting you the economic news you need and can use. In the show today, we'll be talking to Oli Wren about Europe's growth story while taking a look at the changing Nordic economic model. We'll also take a look at a small project making big differences in Portugal's growth. Europe 2020, the EU's plans for future growth, are pretty grand in their aims. 75% employment, 3% of the EU's GDP to be invested in R&D. Then you've got greenhouse emissions that have to be reduced by 20% more than 25 years ago. 40% of people getting college education and then 20 million people to be pulled out of poverty. But the goalposts have moved. The Eurozone crisis means that we have much more immediate concerns to tackle right away. The EU economy has contracted for the last one and a half years and is expected to come in at minus 0.1% in 2013. We know that Greece and Spain's economy are sharply contracting, but even more stable economies like France and Germany are also now feeling the pinch on growth numbers. Unemployment in the EU, especially in the Eurozone, is at a record high. Greece tops the chart, Spain famously follows suit, but even in countries like France and especially Sweden, it's the youth that are really feeling the frustrations of not being able to be productive. So where are we in the European growth story? Sebastian Lebelzik went to Sweden to try and get some answers. Imagine a country in the middle of an economic storm which can keep its head above water. A country where 9 out of 10 people say they are happy. A country whose finances are the healthiest in Europe. That country is Sweden. But behind this apparent cam, the Swedish suburbs are on fire. The origin of the riots is unemployment, which is twice as high among immigrants. Sweden, which it's believed was protected from the financial crisis, is in shock. The economic downturn and the effects of the crisis are being felt here in Sweden. The famous Scandinavian model has had its wings cut, and the urban riots last month have damaged the country's image. It is time to return to the fundamentals of the famous Scandinavian model. It is a model that is the result of 15 years of reform. One job in five in the public sector has been cut. Transport has been privatized. Taxes are among the highest in the world. But social welfare is excellent. Sweden has always outpaced the average figure for growth and employment in the rest of Europe. The government wants to continue its reforms by dipping into its savings. In 2013, the Minister of Finance plans to reduce the rate of corporation tax from 26.3 to 22% and inject more than 600 million euros into infrastructure and R&D. I think the growth and the recovery need some support. And uh, I think obviously we need to continue to restructure public finances. If we get back to, to lack of credibility, that will itself uh, destroy confidence and the recovery. But at least half of the, the EU countries have fiscal space next year. And, and I think that could be used for, for stimulating growth. The drop in interest rates should also help to boost investment in the private sector. With a turnover of more than 25 billion euros, a quarter of Ericsson's 110,000 employees work in research and development. I think in the final end, what we can really compete with and what we need to compete with is the ability to do research and development, put that into innovations and make that through young entrepreneurs and, and a number of new companies growing into real uh, value economy. That's really where the clue lies, I think. Here in the suburbs of Stockholm is the future of growth for Sweden. Here in Chista, Ericsson has set up along with some of the diamonds of the country, like Spotify and Skype. We more and more talk about chasing the talents. We need to attract the talents. And the, the talents want to have more than just a good job or a good pay. They want to have a good life quality as well. The result is that in Chester, four times the number of jobs have been created compared with the rest of the country. It should take Sweden into calmer waters. Joining me to walk the talk of growth is Europe's economic chief, EU Commissioner for Economic and Monetary Affairs, Mr. Olli Rehn. Mr. Rehn, thanks very much for joining us. Now, the inevitable comparison between Nordic countries and their economic models, say for example Sweden and Southern Europe, made many times during this crisis. Do you think that model is usable across Europe or is that model now redundant? The Nordic model has been 
reasonably successful in combining economic competitiveness and social justice. Especially as regards education and innovation, they have been able to provide equal opportunities and provide good business environment for companies. So in that sense, there is something to learn from the Nordic countries. Well, we'll pick up on that in just a bit. We have to go into a break right now. We'll continue the conversation with Mr. Oli Ren. We'll also look at a small project making a big difference to the growth rates in Portugal. But before that, we're going to leave you with Real Economy's crash course. What is GDP? Gross domestic product is calculated by adding up all the final goods and services we buy in a quarter or in a year. Say a baker buys ingredients to make bread. The cost of these raw materials is included in the final price of the bread we buy. The price of that bread, along with the final price of everything we buy, such as food, clothes or electronics, is added to what the government spends on education, health and other services. This creates that big number called GDP, or nominal GDP, which includes all of a country's exports with the imports subtracted. But if prices have gone up in a year, it means inflation is included in GDP. So it will not show whether a country has produced more goods and services. By simply subtracting inflation, we get the real story of whether a country is actually contracting or growing. That's when economists use real GDP. Welcome back to Real Economy. Still with us is EU Commissioner for Economic and Monetary Affairs, Mr. Oli Wren. There is a global perception that the EU is softening its stance on austerity. Is that the right perception that you are now shifting completely towards growth? Um, and if so, how do you answer your critics? We have uh, increased credibility of uh, EU member states uh, in fiscal policy, the European Central Bank has taken decisive action to stabilize uh, the markets uh, and uh, we have uh, a robust uh, framework of uh, medium-term framework of economic governance uh, for gradual fiscal adjustment and uh, the advancement of uh, structural reforms. Uh, so because of these uh, three factors, uh, we can now have uh, a slower pace of uh, fiscal adjustment. When you look at Europe 2020 and the goals and the aims, how close do you think we can get to them by 2020 or do we stay in firefighting mode? It's very difficult to say exactly what are the what are going to be the results of our policies. Of course, starting from the end of this year, having more robust growth next year. So, uh, very difficult to give any quantifiable objectives. But of course, the direction is very clear. On that note, let's talk about a small project that's making big waves in a Portuguese city's growth strategy. Sebastian Le Belzic has been racking up the air miles to get you that story. In a few months, it may take to the air. This electric aircraft, the first of its kind, was created here in the workshop of the University of Porto. It was designed and built by a former student with specialist knowledge of composite materials. Because of our specialist work, a client asked us to build a very light airplane with many special characteristics. We thought it would be a very interesting challenge for us. 130 companies in total, soon it will be 250. The project is funded 30% by the University of Porto and the rest with a budget of 17 million euros from the European Regional Development Fund. We are the largest university in the country, whether by number of students or for scientific publications. But we saw our students going elsewhere to Lisbon and even abroad. There was not the opportunity to stay here. In six years, the Portuguese Silicon Valley has become the true heartbeat of a region in crisis. The Portuguese economy is in its third year of recession. In one year, the country saw its growth fall by 4%. In April, the government presented a plan to provide 2.5 billion euros for SMEs. They will support projects such as Porto. This business combination developed by Porto on the shores of the Atlantic is an example of a marriage between businesses and universities, a healthy one to boost growth. 900 jobs have been created. That's in a country where 17.8% of the population is unemployed. New technology may be the future for Portugal. Mr. Van, how important is it to push for this 
culture or an environment for, say, entrepreneurship, investment, for growth in the EU? I think it's, uh, it's a matter of uh, uh, both or several issues. A major bottleneck, uh, especially in the countries of Southern Europe, uh, is uh, the, the excessively tight credit conditions uh, for small and medium-sized uh, enterprises. Uh, and we are working together with uh, the European Investment Bank uh, and uh, the European Central Bank uh, in order to redress uh, this uh, major problem. And uh, the European Investment Bank uh, received a major capital increase uh, in the end of last year so that it can uh, increase its uh, lending by 40% uh, this year and the next uh, two years. Why is the perception there that it, these are half measures? One of the major problems is that uh, we have uh, several actors uh, who are not always uh, fully coordinated. Uh, all the European institutions uh, have to work uh, in order to find uh, solutions to this uh, major problem of uh, access to finance. That's another perception, that Europe just can't seem to think together. Even if they start thinking together, they can't work together. I don't think that perception is uh, right, actually, because uh, we, have, uh, we have done a lot uh, to uh, contain and uh, overcome the crisis. Uh, we have, for instance, uh, uh, been able to avoid uh, uh, any disorderly defaults in Europe. We are now working uh, towards uh, supporting uh, sustainable growth and uh, job creation. Just my final question to you. Hypothetically, if this was all left up to only you, how would you fix this problem? If I could uh, uh, have influence on the European Central Bank, uh, I could uh, respond to you very openly and, uh, and uh, fully genuinely. Um, of course, the ECB is doing uh, its best in order to have uh, growth supporting uh, monetary policy. I would uh, do whatever it takes in order to restore the credit channel and uh, let the credit flow to small and medium-sized enterprises in Europe uh, because that's where the job creation fundamentally happens uh, and we need that. That's all the time we have for in this episode. On the next episode of Real Economy, we'll address youth unemployment and the potential solutions on offer. Until then, thanks for watching. Goodbye.